Good morning and welcome to Westside Baptist Church. This is Sunday School on the 19th of November 2023. And we are in the last of six different sessions on how to handle the tough questions. And this morning we're talking about, is hell real? According to the Bible, which can't lie, eternal punishment awaits those who do not follow Christ. 67% of Americans believe that hell is real. And 61% says that they believe that hell is, is real. Not much difference. Now, of course, this is not a comfortable subject for most of us, but it is part of the Bible. It is part of the gospel message. Eternal, eternal condemnation and separation from God are the very reasons that Christ died for us. So hell is real, but those of us that know Jesus Christ as our savior and have placed our faith in, in him don't need to worry about that. The scripture that we're going to be using comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 3 through 12. Now, there at Thessalon there at Thessalonica the people in the church had several questions about heaven and and hell and if you remember we saw that there were a lot of other gods that were there. False gods, of course, but they were causing problems for the Christians. And so that's why Paul wrote the second letter uh, to this church to help them understand about hell. So let's pray. Our Lord and God, we again come to look into your word, Lord, to find out how we can answer some of the hard questions that others have for us. So we ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Lord. We ask that you would lead us and that we would understand more and more about hell being real. And I pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 
verses 3 through 7a, the Bible says this. Paul was writing to the Thessalonians and he was thanking them for their stand for God and for their faith and for their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what he said there in verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity, or love, of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense, to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense, saying this over, to recompense the, the tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are, are troubled, rest with us. God does watch over his faithful followers. Paul says that we're bound to thank God always uh, for you because of their testimony and because of their, of their thanksgiving for the trials that they go through and the tribulations. He says that because of those, your faith has grown and uh, it shows. And so he thanked them for their testimony. <clears throat> and so because of their faith, in the Lord, they were doing good works to which God had called them. That's in First uh, Thessalonians 1, uh, verses 3, verses, uh, and Second Thessalonians, verses 1, 11. They were proving their faith with their consistent lifestyles and they were doing good deeds. Ephesians 2.10 and James 2.14 through 26. They showed love to each other and it, it grew and it showed. And because of that, God was answering their prayers. So, Paul was saying, even though you are going through 
the trials and the persecution. We glory in what you are doing for the stand that you take and for the lives that you live each day. And we thank you, he was saying, for your patience and your faith. And because, <coughs> excuse me, of the persecutions, you were being watched over by the Lord, you were being blessed. And you were able to stand, to endure. In other words, you were able to hold up against something without having to give in. So that's why you were seeing the righteous judgment of God. So God looked on them and saw what they were doing and so they blessed them. And their patience and their faith was proof of their genuine salvation. <clears throat> and because of the way that you live and the sufferings that you have, you have been counted worthy of the kingdom of God, not because of the works that you were doing. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and it is not of works, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but it is evidence of your genuine saving faith. And that's why you have been able to endure the persecutions is because of your faith. And also because God has righteous judgment over those that were uh, doing the persecuting. And so he ends it here by saying, and to you who who are troubled rest with us. He's not saying that, that this rest would come soon, but rather exhorted them to continue to endure the persecutions and the tribulations, since they could be confident of their reward. Now, Paul starts to talk about when the Lord comes back again, writing to the Thessalonians in uh, chapter one, uh, verses seven B through 10. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified 
in his saints and to be ad admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So he is saying that those who do not follow God will face eternal destruction. When the Lord shall be revealed, that's when he comes again. There in 1 Corinthians 1.7, 1 Peter 1.7, Verse, and also verse 13 and uh, chapter 4, verse 13 talks about the same thing when the Lord comes. So Jesus will return. He said he would and he can't lie. So he will be here. So that is our hope. And he will come from heaven with his mighty angels. And they are there to stress the divine nature and authority of our Lord and God. Jesus will return as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Revelation 19.16 And he will conquer all the rebellious armies and judge all humanity And his mighty angels will be with him. So he will take vengeance. They had the opportunity to accept him. We call that free will. You either choose to go with God and follow him and obey him, or you choose to go your own way. But here it says it leads uh, to destruction in flaming fire. Many times in the Bible, God has appeared by fire. Exodus 19:18, Ezekiel 1:27, Isaiah 66:15 through 16. Isaiah used the fire actually three different ways, fire, flames of fire, and by fire and by his sword. Jesus, he described hell as the place of the fire that never shall be quenched. Mark 9, 43. John called it the lake of fire in Revelation 20, 14, talking about the vengeance of God. So he is talking about them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
Some scholars say that the first group are the Gentiles and the second group are the Jews. But either way, they refer to all those who reject Jesus as our Savior. So they shall be punished with an everlasting everlasting destruction uh, and John says that they will face an unending punishment in John 5 25 through 29 and John again said there in John 3.16 that those that come to our Lord and Savior will have life everlasting. So they will be kept from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. They will be separated from the Lord's face forever. And those who are true believers shall ever be with the Lord. That's in First Thessalonians 4. Uh, 17 when he shall come that means Jesus will he will come again here in verse 7b Matthew 7:22 and Ephesians 4 verse 30 and he he comes to get all of those that are saved and he comes to be glorified. And of course, he was glorified at the transfiguration. He was uh, spoken to by the Lord at his baptism and so Jesus the son has this essence of glory because of who he is our Lord and Savior he is God he is deity And there in Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21, Paul says that we would share in his glory. So, because of our new relationship with God through faith, they are, we are now a holy nation. First Peter 2.9. And because of our new power in Christ, we are called and enabled to be holy in, in our lifestyles. A lot of people ask, why would a good God send people to an everlasting hell? They ask, isn't God unjust? to punish persons forever for sins. 
that they committed during a limited time here on earth. And the answer is those in hell have committed the the ultimate sin they rejected Jesus as their Lord and Savior here on earth and that was their only chance Some people believe that after you die, you can come to the Lord and that you can be saved. But that is not anywhere in the Bible. It is, you had your choice. You want no God so you get no God. So how can people be sent to hell without knowing its full implications? So what prevents the salvation of anyone or everyone. Individuals choosing freely to reject God and his grace and his salvation. So why did God create people that he knew would reject and be separated from him forever God wants he desires that all people should be saved 1 Timothy 2:4 and 2 Peter 3:9 still many people resist there are not going to be a lot of people that just thought that they were getting fire insurance because the Lord will judge them. Paul goes on to say, in verses 11 and 12 saying that he always prays for these churches all of the churches but he was praying for those and writing to them to help help them solve this problem wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. we have been called by God. The Holy Spirit came to us and we saw our need to be saved and we accepted him and asked him to come into our heart and to be saved and now we should live for him and obey him. 
So we are called and equipped to do good and to bring glory to God. So when Jesus comes back, we need to be working for him. We need to honor him. We need to obey him. He said, we pray always for you talking uh, to this church. Paul would never leave them. The ones that he led to faith and to salvation. And he continued to pray for new converts, new brothers and sisters in, in Christ. That God would count you worthy of his calling. God calls us to salvation by grace. However, he also calls us to a new kind of life and fulfills his purpose in us. Ephesians 4, 1, and also Philippians 3, 14. He, Paul, was urging them and us to honor, honor God's calling uh, to salvation and God's calling them to holy living. That's in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. Paul was saying that they were worthy of this calling because of their service to God and because they had the righteousness of God and they had holy lifestyles. And he emphasized that God would enable them to live in a manner that was consistent with their holy calling, regardless of the cost. And that God would fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness with power. And one of the fruits of the Spirit, it is goodness. That's, that's found in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. They were to live an upright moral life and develop a lifestyle to seek God's standards. And God was working in them to give them power to choose, to will what is good. That's in Philippians 2.13. They were developing the habit of wanting to do God's will. And that's a good start, but it's not enough. Paul also prayed that God would give these believers the power to carry out good works, which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's in Philippians 2.13. 
the only way that they could continue to endure their suffering and persecution was to stay strong in their faith, both in their confidence of their eternal relationship with God through our Lord and Savior. And they were assured by God that he would help them be faithful and obedient. So they were serving, they were working, they were doing good, but they were to reflect the glory of God and the bottom line, God is the only one that should be glorified. And we should be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. So he ends it here by saying, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace is undeserved favor of God in that he provided salvation freely through his son. All of us, were sinners and still are, but we are under the blood now, those of us that are saved. So how do we live this out? We trust. If you are not sure where you will spend eternity, you can settle that by faith in our Lord and Savior. And then study, identify the passages that, uh, here in scripture that refer to hell, read them, and you can make a little chart on where they are so you can show people as you talk to them. Now, you don't want to scare them to death, but you want them to understand that there's only two choices, heaven or hell. It's just that simple. And we often have a problem uh, when we try to talk to somebody about heaven and hell. But we can work on that and allow the Holy Spirit to work through us as we talk to people and also share with them. So let us pray. Our Lord and God, we thank you for your word. And your word is very clear that there is heaven and those of us that are saved are on our way to heaven to live with you forever and the other choice is uh, to reject our Lord and Savior and and to think that we can be good enough that we can you know, buy our way in, that we can do other things 
Uh, but the Bible says there is only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, Lord, we ask that you would help us through the guidance of the Holy Spirit that we would know how to do and how to say the right things when it comes to the point that we can talk to someone about this heaven and hell. And I pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.